Please join me in prayer. Well, Father, we thank you this morning for the gift of your word. We thank you for your word, which is sweeter than the honeycomb. Your word, which is true. Your word, which is authoritative. Your word, God, which is your revelation to us. Your self-revelation, telling us about you, telling us about us, telling us about who we are and what you're doing in the world. This morning, Father, we gather to hear from you. We don't gather to hear from me. We don't gather to hear from any man, but we want to hear from the living God. So, Father, I pray now that you would please bless the preaching of your word. Speak through me, Father. Help me to speak true words, clear words, words that are appropriately exulting in the God that we worship. Father, help us to hear from you this morning and help us, God, to leave here today more aware of your glory, more aware of your grace than of our sin, more aware of your power than our weakness. Speak to us now, Father, this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the book of Acts, chapter 21, as you know, we've been working our way slowly through the book of Acts over the course of the last year. This, is, this marks the 43rd sermon in the book of Acts, and we are now rapidly approaching the end of this book. After today, we have three more sermons left in this book, which if you're looking, you think, okay, 20 chapters and 43 sermons, now we're going to do eight in four sermons. So that means that we're going to be moving fast. We're going to be covering three chapters this morning, so I'm going to talk as quickly as I can, as clearly as I can, but we're going to be moving fast. These last, cha- these last eight chapters represent a shift in focus. They shift the focus a bit as we continue to see and observe the progress of the gospel, the gospel advancing in the land, but it's increasingly in the context of suffering. It's increasingly in the context of opposition and persecution of God's people. Just as Christ Jesus moved towards suffering in Jerusalem, so the Apostle Paul now suffers as he takes the gospel. As he takes his own cross and follows in his Savior's footsteps in moving toward Jerusalem and ultimately then to Rome. These chapters focus squarely on Paul, on what's going on in his life, giving us an example of how believers are to respond in the face of trials, in the face of suffering, in the face of opposition, pain, and difficulties. And we'll see that confidence in the gospel will see us through the fiercest storms in life. Confidence in the gospel will see us through the darkest hours. The unfailing power of the gospel will prevail. That's our hope this morning. So that sets the context a bit for these final chapters. We now see Paul coming to an end of his missionary journeys. If you, you know, flip to the back of your Bible, there's usually like maps of, different, of his different missionary journeys. He had three missionary journeys, three very purposeful gospel-proclaiming missionary journeys. At first, he goes into the heartland of Asia Minor, and then further on to Macedonia and to Greece. And always, all that time, Paul has his eyes fixed. Where? He has his eyes fixed on Rome. To the furthest reaches of the then known world, Paul wants to get to Rome. Last week we saw Paul end his journey and land in Jerusalem. And this this marks the end this morning of his travels as a free man. Here in chapter 21, we see Paul arrested. And Paul will spend the rest of his days as a prisoner. This is the last of Paul as a free man. He's enduring unjust accusations. He's enduring mistreatment. He's no longer free to move around or just to come and go as he's been able to before. There's all kinds of hardship and suffering that would come as a result of his gospel advancing work, both physically and emotionally. And all all of these challenges, they take a toll on you physically and emotionally. You can imagine how exhausted, how assailed Paul is after all that he's been through and he's he's probably wondering you can imagine as he's sitting in jail after he's been giving his life to the advancing work of the gospel and he's sitting in jail and he feels alone and he's he's he maybe wondering what's going on here God God what where are you here in this why am I suffering this way God what are you doing and all too often I think 
We can identify with that. We can oftentimes find ourselves in situations, can't we, where we can ask God, what are you doing here? Why this? Why me? Why now? Why again? I think we can all identify with that in various ways. Maybe you can identify that this morning. Maybe it's a job situation goes bad or, or we lose a job or, or health goes bad unexpectedly. You get a bad diagnosis from the doctor or some life situation just gets hard. Sometimes a combination of all of these things all at once. Maybe we feel like Job where I get this bad report and then I turn around and I get this bad report and then this bad thing happens and, and it goes on for a while and then, and then a while longer. And then sometimes something else happens. Some new unexpected expense just throws your finances off. Some new relational hardship and we can find ourselves wondering, God, what is going on? I mean, God, do you see this? Are you paying attention? Do you see what's going on here, Father? Aren't you in control? Why are you allowing this to happen? It's a question that we can ask, right? And, and we don't usually get answers, at least not right away. Many times, most of the time, we cannot see the reason why things are happening the way that they are. But my purpose this morning, I believe one of the great purposes of these chapters, of this text, of this book, is to help us believe, to remind us that God is at work. He is advancing his gospel, and he is watching over us always, at all times. He does not abandon his people. But I tell you, it can be so hard to see that at times, can it? It can be so hard to see the grace of God and the kindness of Jesus at work in our lives at times. And that's what we need in our lives. We need God's grace. We need the kindness of Jesus. And God's word is here to tell us this morning that God's grace is not absent from your life. Jesus and all of his kindness is not absent from your life. You have not been abandoned. What we have here in all of Scripture, and certainly here in the book of Acts, is a record of God at work. God is working in the lives of his people but in ways that are not always clear to us. In fact, much of the time, it's downright unclear what God is doing. So what are we to do? How are we to think? How are we to live when it's not clear what God is doing? And the circumstances of our lives are challenging. They're hard. They're painful. They're difficult. Well, we have an account here in the book of Acts, chapter 21 through 23. And it's really, it's really just a description of what's going on in the life of Paul. As you read this and... and and I hope, so we're covering three chapters this morning. I did the math on this. It's 2,400 words. So last or two weeks ago, John preached 16 verses. This morning, three chapters, 2,400 words. It'll take me 24 minutes to read this text. We take time to read that this morning. So I'm going to read sections of it. I hope you read it in advance. If you didn't, you know, take time to read that when you're at home. You can probably read that faster than I can speak it. But in these chapters, it's really just a description of what's going on in Paul's life. The rest of the book of Acts, there are no more miracles, no more conversions. You don't see God acting miraculously through the rest of these chapters. And so you can kind of read this. You're like, okay, well, we've kind of gotten past all the exciting stuff. Now it's just, now it's just kind of housekeeping, administrative. Uh, he's just telling us what happens in Paul's life. It reminds me of the book of Esther in the Old Testament. You've read the book of Esther. You're familiar with that story? The book of Esther has no mention of God whatsoever in the entire book. None. In fact, you might say, well, then what is that doing in the Bible? Right? You've got this entire book with no mention of God in the Bible. But it's there because it's one of the most magnificent stories of God at work. Behind the scenes. Providentially. Not miraculously. You know the difference between providential work and miraculous work. Prov or miraculously, God is interrupting the natural order. So God breaks in and he interrupts the natural order. So, so chains fall off of Peter's wrist. The, the jail door is opened and he's set free. God is interrupting the natural orders. He accomplishes his purposes and advances his gospel miraculously. But providential Work is different. 
So in providence, God directs the natural order. He doesn't interrupt the natural order, but he directs the natural order. Providence is when God gets his will done, not by changing the natural order, but by directing the ordinary events of our lives, ordinary natural circumstances, accomplishing what he wants, accomplishing his purposes, advancing the gospel. Both of them are God at work, both miraculously and providentially. But it's the second way, the harder way to see at times that God is working here in this section and really for the rest of this book. So that's what we're going to see this morning. It's not just you know, details. It's not just you know, a description of Paul's life. Though that's what it seems to be on the face of it. But God is, while God is almost completely silent in these final chapters, without question, God is working. And that's true in your life today, too. There are times in our life when God seems to be just interrupting our life constantly, miraculously, bringing events and divine appointments, and you just see God's miraculous provision. And there's other times where he's just silent. And you just wonder. It just seems like kind of the same old thing. I go to work, and I come home, and I change the diapers, and I clean the dishes, and I go to bed, and I get up, and I'm achy, and I'm sore. And we're dealing with suffering and opposition in all sorts of ways. So even though there's no miracle miracle here, even though there's no direct activity from God, we see God at work. So let's just go over. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to go over what happens here. Three chapters, 2,400 words. So again, if you didn't read it already, take time to read it. When you get home today, I'm going to read certain sections. Uh, We're just going to walk through these chapters and kind of summarize what happens. And I'm going to ask two questions after we do that. And I've got some just kind of some practical pastoral counsel you're from God's word for you this morning if you find yourself in the midst of suffering. So Acts chapter 1, 21, I'm going to go ahead and read this first section together. So I'm going to read these first uh, verses 17 through 26. We'll read this in the, their entirety, and then we'll comment on them a little bit, and then we'll just kind of move through the rest of the text. All right? So Acts chapter 21, verse 17, read with me. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with, with us to, to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. This, this, thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood, and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification will be fulfilled and the offering presented for each of them. So they were received gladly. Paul recounts God's work which leads them to worship God. And I just want to point out the fact here that God is, that Paul is celebrating God's work. Okay, you read all these things about Paul and what he's doing is he's not celebrating. He's not telling them about all of his suffering. He's not telling them, look at all the things that I did. Look at all these amazing things. Look at all these conversions that I have. Now that's, that might be how I'm tempted, but Paul is a humble man. Paul is a man who has been saved by the grace of God, who has received mercy from God, and he's aware of that. He's aware that all that happens in his life is a result of God's activity, God's miraculous work, God's providential work, not his. So Paul is a humble man, but then there's a situation with these Jews. These Jews, these zealous Jews come, and they're suspicious of Paul's teaching, and they're telling the Jewish believer, they're saying that Paul, they're accusing Paul of saying that he is uh, telling the Jews to forsake all of their customs. He's saying he is telling them not to uh, you know, circumcise their children and so on and so forth. And so they're reacting in fear out of their way of life being cast off. And so James, insists, James counsels Paul and says, Paul, observe this seven-day ritual of purification. In addition to that, here's these four other guys. We want you to pay their way because doing this 
will certainly satisfy the Jews. It will certainly show them that there's nothing in their claims about you, nothing in these false accusations about you. And so Paul does this. He does this for the sake of the gospel among the Jews. And I have to be honest here, when I first read this section, I'm kind of wondering, okay, Paul, what are you doing? I, we just read Acts 15. You know, I thought that this was to be done away with. And here Paul is obeying this purification ritual for seven days. What is he doing? But it's here we want to remember not to interpret you know, obscure sections without looking at the clear and unambiguous section. The Jerusalem leaders are not here going back on Acts 15. They're not here revisiting the question of whether or not the Gentile believers are to obey the Mosaic law, but rather the role of the law in the life of Jewish Christians, those who grew up in Jewish customs obeying Jewish rituals. David Peterson is helpful here. He says, there's been no indication in Acts so far that Paul was explicitly encouraging Jewish converts to abandon their law or their customs. Even in his letters, he does not do this, though he treats these matters as neither necessary for salvation nor binding on their conscience. He goes on to say, even, even Paul's arguments about strong believers and weak believers later on, well, or even strong believers welcoming and supporting weak believers with scruples about matter and food and drink and ritual conveyed the impression that his position as a liberated Jew was ultimately the most desirable. So Paul is submitting to these rituals for the sake of the gospel, but he is not bound by them. They are not conscience-bound or duty-bound to obey them. So he does them for the sake of the gospel, but not in order to win you know, acceptance from God. Does that make sense? So Paul's willingness to observe this vow demonstrates his willingness to lay down his freedoms. He was free in the gospel, but he was also happy and willing to lay down that freedom not to eat meat, or not to do this, or to observe a ritual for the sake of the advance of the gospel. So next section, 21, 27 through 22, 21. So now we have these Jews coming in from Asia, stirring up the crowd. So Paul observes this ritual, but even though he observes it, he finds himself, when the, days were, when the seven days were almost completed, it says, the Jews from Asia, in verse 27, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the crowd and laid hands on him. So you have this mob coming up and seizing Paul. They're coming, and they want to kill him. They're angry, and they want to do away with him. They are beating him. They drag him out, seeking to kill him. And in verse 31, look with me. In verse 31, it says, They were seeking to kill him, and word came to the tribune of the cohort. Now, that's the, that's the Roman authorities. That's the Roman government. That all Jerusalem was in confusion. And so the cohort, the tribune, he at once takes soldiers and centurions and runs down to them. I love this. The government of Rome is protecting Paul. The government of Rome is protecting him and seizing him for his sake, for his well-being. There's irony here. The Roman government is protecting Paul from the religious authorities and leaders. So Paul is, grand, so Paul is seized. He is arrested. He is bound with chains in verse 33. And he goes on and he appeals, can I please address the crowd? Okay, so there's a lot going on here. And he says, I want to address the crowd, and he does so in Hebrew. And what Paul does is Paul goes on to talk about his Jewish pedigree. Paul goes on to say, look, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew of Jews. I studied under Gamaliel. I persecuted the way, much like all of you. You think you're zealous? I was the king of the zealots. Paul cites his Jewish pedigree, addressing the crowd not as enemies, but as brothers and fathers. He's speaking to them in affection, but he goes on to tell of his conversion. Read with me verses 14 through 22. This is after, this is after Paul has been, you know, he was walking on the, the Damascus Road on the horse, and he, you know, a light shines on him and all this, and then he's bl struck blind, uh, and Ananias comes to him. And he says in verse 14, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Verse 17, When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly. Jerusalem quickly. 
because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And look at what happens. A riot ensues. When he mentions going to the Gentiles, this was heresy to the Jewish ears. This was, this was Paul saying, speaking for God, that the gospel was going forth, that the Messiah was going to the Gentiles, and this riot ensues. So the next section, verses 22 through the end of chapter 35, here's what's going on. Okay, I'm just going to skip around a little bit here. So Paul is before the Roman tribune. You see that in verse 22. That's the heading. They are furious over Paul's mention of the Gentiles. The Jews are insisting that he be put to death. Okay? And the tribune orders flogging, and Paul goes to them, and he says in verse 25, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? And this was absolutely not legal. It was illegal for them to flog Roman citizens. Citizenship was a big deal. And Paul claims Roman citizenship not. You know, the tribune says, hey, I had to purchase my citizenship. And Paul says, I was born one, which is a higher level. You know, so Paul is saying, look, you have no right, no authority to beat me. And so then Paul goes before the council. And Paul is before the chief priest in the council. And Ananias, the high priest, listened to him. And orders Paul to be struck on the mouth. Smack that man on the mouth. He, orders, he looks over there at one of the soldiers and orders him to strike him in the face. He's beating him. And so Paul responds, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. Now, Paul is addressing the high priest, and he's rebuked for speaking to the high priest this way. And so he actually says, I didn't know the high priest. It's not clear if he literally didn't know him or if he's you know, speaking like, judging by his standards, I couldn't tell that he was the high priest. But regardless, he says, I wouldn't speak that way of the high priest. So he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's addressing them. And seeing the Pharisees and the Sadducees there, he shouts out, he starts talking about the resurrection from the dead. In verse 7, it says that a dissension then arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So, he is, so now there's division among the Jews themselves. And you see the Pharisees actually declaring him innocent. So the scribes of the Pharisees declare Paul to be innocent. And the tribune takes Paul away in order to protect him. Verse 11, read this. This is amazing. This is the one instance of God being present in these entire chapters. Verse 11, the following night, the Lord stood by him and said to Paul, take courage. He's in the midst of suffering. He's in the midst of opposition. He's in the midst of false accusations and beating and, and, a lot, and you know, being maligned and thrown in jail. And God shows up to him. It says, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so also must you testify in Rome. Verse 12, the Jews make a plot. They have 70 men, 70 men taking a vow, saying, I will, never, I will neither eat nor drink until we kill this man, Paul. So 70 men are plotting to kill Paul. And then we have this other irony, this young boy Paul's sister's son, so Paul's nephew, discovers the plot, warns Paul, tells the tribune. The tribune arranges a great security detail. He had 400 soldiers. He orders half of them to take Paul and escort him to Felix, the governor. Again, for safety reasons for Paul. So the Roman government is protecting Paul. And the tribune sends a letter to Felix. Felix guards Paul in Herod's praetorium and assures him that he will hear Paul when his accusers arrive. And so in, in jail... Paul sits and waits, and that's where we end our section. So he's sitting in jail. He's been beaten. He's been falsely accused. He's made his defense before the people, before the Jewish council. Things aren't going well. Another riot breaks out. People are trying to kill him. 
Uh, and so the Roman commander there sends him away to protect him. So Lysias writes Felix's letter, and the soldiers take him to, uh, up there to, uh, to Caesarea, and that's where he sits in jail. That's where he's waiting. That's where he's wondering, God, where are you? You told me I'm going to Rome. You told me to take courage. Where are you? What are you doing here? What's going on? All right, so two questions. What is God doing here? What is God doing here in these chapters? What is Paul doing? It doesn't say what he's doing explicitly. We see the unfolding providential work of God in the life of Paul. But what is God doing? Here's what God's doing. He is advancing his gospel and he is caring for his people. God is accomplishing his purpose. It says in Isaiah, I will accomplish my purposes. They shall stand. Nothing can hinder them. God is accomplishing his purposes, advancing his gospel. Remember back in chapter 1, when Jesus is speaking to his people, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth. And Jesus had said when he was with them, I will build my church. And that's what he's doing. That's, this is how he's doing it. Paul, Jesus is building his church. He's sending witnesses throughout the whole world. And Paul was one of those witnesses accomplishing God's work. In fact, look, look back with me for just a minute. Go back to chapter 20, verse 24. This is Paul saying, But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul is one of those witnesses, and he is accomplishing God's purposes by God's providential hand, advancing the gospel even while in chains, even while being beaten, even while walking the path of suffering. He's accomplishing God's purposes. And what a thing in verse, in chapter 20 to 23, verse 11, when the Lord shows up to him, he comes and stands by him. And I, you've got to love this, that God is present with him in the midst of his suffering. The seemingly forsaken man, everybody is against him. He's wondering, he's laying there. You know, he had just been, uh, you know, alerted about this plot to kill him. He's wondering if he's about to be torn in two, stoned and beaten and left for dead again. And now he's sitting there in jail wondering what's about to happen, having no idea. He's expressed his, his desire to God and to others that he wants to go to Rome. And now he's just sitting there and God shows up to him and says, Paul, take courage. Paul, you are going to Rome. I will get you there. And then do you see what's going on? Paul is getting closer. So at, at the end of this chapter, Paul is now 60 miles closer to Rome. When he gets to Caesarea, that's 60 miles closer to Rome than when we started. So God is advancing his purposes even there. Jesus is building his church. God is advancing his purposes, his gospel, accomplishing his will. And he's using his people to do that so that people in the farthest reaches of the kingdom who are presently laboring in the total darkness of paganism and secularism so that those people can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why you and I are here this morning, because of this act, because of these chapters. These chapters are not just throwaway chapters. They're not just administrative detail that are unnecessary. That's what God is doing. And listen, I want you to see something. Paul has this, has this mindset about his suffering. In fact, flip over uh, chapter uh, Philippians, sorry, chapter Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 12. Philippians 1, verse 12. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul sees this now. Paul sees God at work advancing his gospel, accomplishing his purposes, and caring for his people so that he is able to say Philippians is written while he's in jail. Okay, keep that in mind. The happiest letter in the Bible, which I can't wait to get to someday. I can't wait for us to study that book together. It's the happiest book in the Bible. Paul writes the happiest book in the Bible while he's being beaten 
and being falsely accused, and he's sitting in jail, walking the path of suffering. We want that mindset in our lives, don't we? So one more question as we close. That is, how do we walk this path of suffering? How do we now walk the path of suffering? We see this in the life of Paul. We all know suffering in various ways. Some of us are currently there. Some of us have recently been there. Some of us, all of us will be there again before long in various ways. So how do we do that? There are moments when walking the path of suffering, we, when we feel paralyzed, we feel like we can't take another step. We feel like we might just fall down and collapse. And it's in those moments, moments when we feel like we might just be torn in two, the hard, dark moments that God comes and he speaks to us words of extraordinary comfort and strength to our soul, telling us to take heart, take courage. And it's God's desire that any of us this morning who find ourselves there hear this, that we would heed his words of comfort and our soul would be strengthened by that, that we would be encouraged, encouraged that we would take courage. God comes to you just as he came to Paul and he revealed certain truth and he says to you, just as I have been faithful to you up to this point in your life, so I will remain faithful to you all the rest of your days. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will never abandon you. None will snatch them from my hand, says Jesus. What massive encouragement we have as we walk the path of suffering, as we follow the footsteps of Christ Jesus. So how do we respond in the moments of suffering? How do we respond on the path of suffering? We take heart. We take courage. By the grace of God, having seen the knowledge of Jesus Christ revealed to us, having experienced the mercy of God, having the hope of the resurrection and aware of the nearness of God, we take courage, friends. In our despair, in our weakness, we know that God will never forsake us because his word has declared that to be true, and we have seen that time and again. And that changes everything as we walk this path. So brothers and sisters, how do you view your suffering? I want Paul to address you this morning. I want Paul to answer this question. How do you view your suffering? Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 10. Paul says, Whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Whatever gain I had, loss so that I may share in his suffering, so that I may become like Jesus. Gain, loss. We view it as one of the greatest privileges in the Christian life to follow in the footsteps of our Savior who suffered and bled for our behalf. Get this view of suffering, brothers and sisters. How do we view being wronged by others? Have you been wronged by others? Have you been spoken ill of? Have you been mistreated, falsely accused? Do others hurt you? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, Paul says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. How do we view, how do we view the suffering of the wasting away of our physical bodies? Get up and, and you're just aching and you see different things happening in your body that yeah, that wasn't there before. You talk to the doctor and you get some hard, hard news. How do we view the wasting away of our physical bodies? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. So we do not lose heart. Though our, outer, uh, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day for this slight momentary affliction. And keep in mind, who's writing these words? The Apostle Paul, who has been stoned, beaten, left for dead multiple times, falsely accused, harassed on every side, thrown in jail, spends the rest of his life imprisoned. <laughs> this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
That's how we view the wasting away of our physical bodies. How do we view now bearing witness in evangelism? Acts 20, 24. Like Paul, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. How do we now view death, brothers and sisters? Death itself, the last great enemy. Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. With full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And how do we now view the, the future? The uncertain future when God is just not aware of what he's doing and where he's going and what he's accomplishing in his life, if he's even there, is he aware of what's going on right now? How do we view the future? Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 38. When uncertainty is abounding in your life, read these words. Remind yourself of these words. This is God's word to you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is our sure and steady hope. That is our anchor, brothers and sisters. In moments when God is quiet, remind yourself of the time that God has spoken clearly, unambiguously, forever to you and to me and that gives us hope that reminds us that he is there that reminds us that God has not abandoned us he has not forsaken us that is how we view the future confidence in the face of God trusting him following in the Savior's footsteps take heart brothers and sisters take courage this morning there is a man who is willing to walk the path of suffering, and he knew that affliction was in his future, and he set his face and marched toward there for your sake and mine. Because he went there for us, our path of suffering has been changed forever, and we now have the keys to walk the path of suffering following the footsteps of our Savior. In Christ, God has given you all you need to pick up your cross and to follow him and to lay down your life in allegiance to him all our days. And that should help us to take heart. Please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you now. asking you for mercy. Aware, Father, that even when it seems that you are far from us, Lord, that you are always near to us. Father, I pray this morning that you would reveal to us your providential work in our lives. It's so hard, Father, to see where you're at work, when we feel the mistreatment from others, when we walk the path of suffering, when we are enduring wrongdoing, when we wonder, why are you so silent right now? Why are you allowing my enemies victory? Why do the wicked prosper? Why am I suffering? Father. Father, I pray that you would quicken to us your word in these moments. Remind us of your truth. Speak to us, Father, in your nearness and lift up our gaze to see you. A child holding the hand of his father is not frightened 
walking down the street. Father, we know that you are near to us, but we are so fickle in our hearts and so quick to unbelieve. Help us, Father, in these moments. And Father, I pray, Lord, this morning for any who are walking the path of suffering right now, God, that you would comfort them in their affliction. That you would grant relief. That you would grant healing. That you would use the body of Christ to minister to those who are hurting this morning. Help us, Lord, to take personal responsibility for the well-being of our brother and our sister, of our neighbor. Help us, Lord, give us loving words and skillful words to speak hope to our hurting brothers and sisters. Help us, Lord, to leave here today with greater confidence in you. Help us, Father, to take heart, to take courage, confident that you are accomplishing your purposes. Your purpose will stand. Nothing can hinder it. You are advancing your gospel, and you are caring for your people. So, God, help us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.